Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Hannah Mason. I'm a technical editor at Composites World. I wanna thank you for joining us today for this webinar titled Designing with Graphene in Mind, brought to you by Composites World and presented by Mito Material Solutions. Our presenter today is Kevin Keith, CTO and co-founder of Mito Material Solutions. Kevin holds a degree in mechanical engineering and was named a featured honoree in the 2020 Forbes 30 Under 30 Manufacturing and Industry List. His goal is to find new applications for solutions created by Mido, and he'll be telling us a little bit about the work Mido is doing on that here today. So there'll be a Q&A session at the end of Keith's presentation today, and attendees, you can submit questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A field that you see on your screen, and then we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. I do also want to note that the webinar is being recorded, and when complete, will be made available to you via email from Composites World. So you'll also be able to watch it back later. So um, without further ado, welcome, Kevin. It's all yours. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I want to kind of talk to everybody about how to design with a relatively new material, graphene in mind, uh, to their composite structures. So uh, a little background of Mido is that we are not a graphene producer, but we are a graphene functionalizer. Um, what we are able to do is we are a middle person to take different sources of graphene, graphene oxide, uh, sometimes graphite, uh, put it through a chemical process, and you're able to make a multifunctional hybrid material with that feedstock. Um, that way it, it plugs in more directly, it's more compatible, easier to integrate, and it's solving a lot of the different problems that graphene has exhibited in the market space. Uh, so we've been named the top advanced material solutions provider in uh, 2022, and we are the first and only verified functionalized graphene producer by the Graphene Council, uh, a third-party council that is thousands of members from end users to graphene producers. Uh, so we are verified hybrid material. And as Hannah said, uh, we were featured on Forbes 30 Under 30, and we just finished up a uh, Greentown Accelerator partnered with BASF and Magna, who has tried graphene for years, uh, has failed at it because graphene being graphene, uh, it is hard to understand the nuances that go into choosing what graphene to use. And so at Mido, uh, how we make it different is that we, we hybridize these graphene materials. Uh, in the top right of the screen, you'll see a dispersion comparison at 0.1% by weight concentration just use with a shear mixer. So on the left of that, you'll see graphene, very clumpy, um, very hard to integrate, but on the right is what we call Mito Ego, which is a combination of graphene oxide and an epoxide POS, which is a silane cage structure that has epoxide functionalities on there that are grafted to those graphene oxide platelets. Uh, under SEM, uh, right underneath that picture, uh, you will see what is Ego. Um, this is a micron-sized particle, but when you compound it into thermosets or thermoplastics, it reactively disperses uh, because of that increased chemical compatibility. Uh, we see large, per, uh, large performance increases any, with loadings of 0.05 to 1%, ranging up to 135% beyond baseline in fiber-reinforced structures. And so not only do you get these mechanical performances, but... Ultimately, you get a material that is now multifunctional. So because you make it stronger, you're able to use less material to lightweight your part, as well as increased or decreased thermal electrical conductivity, um, damping properties, uh, noise vibration harshness reduction, uh, increased processing time, all dependent on what feedstock you choose to put into your system. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So graphene in general, uh, I'm sure everybody is well aware of it, discovered in 2004, Nobel Prize in 2014, was slapped into everything, and everybody said, oh, it doesn't work. That's because everybody kind of thought that graphene was just graphene. You could get it from one person, uh, it translates across all the other graphene producers in the world, and if it doesn't work with one person, it's not going to work in general. On the slide here, these are all considered graphene, but you'll notice that they are very different in structure. Um, the top right is considered graphene itself, but whenever you look at it, even under SEM, uh, XRD, common 
uh, characterizing methods, you see that it's more along the lines of graphite. So morphology and how it's structured really plays into how you choose things. So it dictates integration and performance because if you have a certain structure that's more flat, it's harder to integrate, but you can use it in a way that can really increase electrical thermal conductivity and mechanical increases. But if you have a more uh, ball-like structure, it's the opposite. Sources wise, I mean, you can go anywhere between graphite, um, cracked gases to where they put it through a plasma process and it reforms those carbon structures into graphene, uh, as well as even um, processing methods. If it's chemical exfoliation, mechanical exfoliation, there's a lot of different nuances that plays into this morphology that also drives price, quality, and performance. And on top of that, if it's processed at, in a such a way so if i use a, like a, a cracking method that uses uh, i don't know a, a waste gas from a natural gas production as compared to uh, one that is using a fresh gas feed source it can form totally different defects uh, and residuals so you can have more oxygen in one or less oxygen in the other as well as different like swiss cheese effects in the center so that also dictates a lot of performance attributes as well as integration. So graphene has always had this promise of the next wonder material, uh, but it's actually harming it. So we're, we're going to go through a couple of promises made, broken, and as to why, uh, because a lot of it actually plays back to the morphology processing and sources. So Papers in the past have said that a single bit of graphene can make polymers 500% stronger. Uh, if you really dig into those papers, um, it is heavily processed. Uh, it requires very special mixing procedures, and it's totally hypothetical. To plug that into a manufacturing method um, is just not realistic. So in order to better dictate why you can do that is that you you can do that. Um, it's just going to crazily increase the cost. So on top of that, another promise that they've made is that graphene has an infinite electrical and thermal conductivity value uh, by itself in a very pristine form in a very flat structure. Uh, but in application, no, um, because of a lot of how you can't really dictate how the platelets are forming together and contacting. You have to hit a certain percolation value uh, with a very, very flat structure, uh, but it needs to be loaded extremely high. Uh, to date, not many people have been able to get it into a liquid system in order to not affect the viscosity, but also hit these percolation values. Um, whenever you get into different morphological structures as well, uh, it actually drives these values a lot differently than you would expect. Um, and then there have been claims in the past that graphene by itself is very easy to disperse. Um, no, it, it, uh, most of the time it requires very high energy inputs, whether it's uh, like a thinky mixer or a sonicator or a homogenizer, because the way that graphene likes to stack together is very high level. It's because it, it likes to favor itself more than anything else. Um, a lot of things go into play with that, with you know specific surface area and layer counts and particle size, because if you have a very large surface area for this graphene, you're going to have a very small particle size. And then if you try to get that into a system that has a really high uh, uh, surface tension, it's not going to disperse very easily. So you have to put a lot of energy and put some different carriers and do a lot of different things with it. So... That's, that's what we do at Mido. So, for instance, whenever we process our graphene oxide to make Ego, uh, we were able to shop it out to Folsom Custom Skis. Uh, they are a ski manufacturer in Denver uh, that hand lays up all their skis. Uh, so, in 2020, they loaded our product at 1% by weight into the Part A resin, which is relatively high. We usually recommend 10 times lower than that. But they saw a strength increase of 35%, as well as a damping increase of 100%. So 
the way that skis are made is that you have a bunch of wood cores sandwiched together, and then you skin that with your composites uh, with some metal and other uh, conductive films on the bottom as well. So because of these properties, they were able to say, hey, this is pretty neat. And they went back to the drawing board and they were able to take out 18% of their total weight just by plugging in 10 grams of our material into their ski mix. Now, they were able to use less uh, PE, wood core, steel. I mean, take a lot of stuff out that saved them ultimately time, um, but also made them one of the lightest skis on the market. Now, what played into that damping property is the morphology. Um, you were able to cross-link and better uh, hold everything together better, uh, but in turn, you were able to actually dissipate a lot of these higher energy, uh, no, higher frequency, lower energies that it was snapping back to shape a lot quicker. And another case in point is that St. Croix Rods was able to take our spray system and apply it to their prepregs. Uh, they were using a unidirectional prepreg, epoxy based. Uh, they've been aware of graphene as well. Uh, but they knew it had a lot of promise and didn't deliver on a whole lot of those. And so we knew because of our chemistry and morphology, we were pairing really well into their system. And they found that in two separate builds at a 0.05% was their most optimal desired loading is that we increase their sensitivity so they can feel a lot more coming through the rod. The recovery rate was not as good as the control, but the fact that you were able to have a 79% increase in strength based on their proprietary testing method of uh, dynamic hook setting scenarios, or that 0.05% was able to increase it within a six foot rod. Now, on a medium fast action, what they found is that 0.5% uh, was able to do the same amount of work. Now, it settled back to shape a lot quicker, you could feel a lot more, and that's because the morphology is driving that. Now, when you look at a non-functionalized graphene using the same exact setting, what people didn't understand in the past is how the, the sources and the structures all come together a lot better to actually provide these sort of increases. Now, you'll see that the percent improvement when incorporated into their prepreg system, you get single-digit increases. It doesn't really justify the cost of graphene, but you really have to think through what attributes a I want to increase in my material, but b what what uh, buckets and levers do I want to pull with my feedstock to go into that? Now, because of that, you can hit a lot of different multifunctional properties. So, for instance, graphene A is something that has a very high specific surface area, more few layers. So, between one and five layer graphene. Uh, and then graphene B is between five and 10 layers, uh, a little bit more crumpled, has a lower specific surface area. And so while graphene A provides a, con a thermal conductivity increase, B actually decreases for a lot of different nuanced properties. Now, when you look at vibration damping, graphene B beats out A because of how it's, it's crumpling in that specific surface area is lower. So it's kind of getting in the way of how the vibration travels through the composite. Then whenever you look at a mechanical strength increase, it's driven by what polymer you plug into, but graphene B, no change, but graphene A, because of that high surface area and that high uh, likelihood of improper non-homogeneous dispersion, it actually decreases that strength because it gets, away in the, it gets in the way of the crystallinity aspect of your polymer. Then, of course, whenever it comes to chemical resistance, graphene in general, it does increase overall. So at this point, you can kind of look at, oh, what source do I want, what particle size, and then what morphology do I need in order to drive what properties and levers you want to pull. So with all of that is what we've been able to see is that whenever you're plugging, when you know what buckets you're looking at, when you know exactly what properties you want to affect, and what graphene you need to look at, you can shorten your material qualification time. So when you're looking at plugging like a uh, graphene A directly into your composite, you know generally what it's going to do. It's going to take some tweaking, but ultimately you don't need to reformulate what you have going on. You don't need to go back to the drawing board formulation bench and refigure out what's going on and increase your R&D time. Most of the time, what we've seen is that 
it's very dosage dependent on the polymer system you go into. So if usually with graphene, less is more. So whenever you load it at 0.5% and you see no change, that's actually a silver lining for the fact that when, when you load it that comparatively high and it's no change, it's really that it's overcoming some of the defects that, that is happening. So you can actually start bottoming out and lowering how much you're actually loading into it. And because it's all very doshas dependent and you're already working with material that's qualified, it's all driven by a baseline comparison. So you're able to say, all right, this material, like it's okay, but I really needed to get to here. And you can start tweaking with your loading because you know the morphology and the defects and all the chemical composition of your graphene to better understand how it's going to affect your polymer. So while it's an additional ingredient and you don't have to go back to the drawing board, it, you're still comparing it to that uh, baseline. So it really expedites the qualification timeline. We've seen this actually jump from a couple of years to a couple of months um, just because you're able to quickly tweak and plug in something that compatibly goes into your system. So uh, plug time, um, mino materials, uh, we, we see ourselves as that expert within bridging the gap between the graphene users and the graphene suppliers. So whenever you go to a graphene supplier, generally from our experience, some people kind of promise the world, right? They're saying, oh, it'll provide X, Y, Z. Whenever you plug it into your system, it'll be super great. But the trick is you have to do something extra with it. And you have to understand how a lot of these different buckets, the morphology, the source, composition, um, defects, is going to be able to attach some extra things on there and to plug into different systems. That way it's more compatible for you. And it, it actually provides the increases that is sought by lowering that barrier to entry because of the additional comp uh, chemical compatibility, ease of integration. I mean, really solving all the problems that graphene has been facing. Um, we, we fully believe that graphene is actually finally, finally, finally on the cusp of being fully integrated into a lot of different applications, uh, whether it's concrete on a very massive scale, uh, asphalt, composites, thermosets of thermoplastics, uh, we're finally truly understanding how it can be fully plugged into those systems because of the standards that are being put in place by ISO and ANSI this year. So I love answering questions because I understand that you can only learn so much from a presentation and you don't want to be talked at. And so um, please fire away any questions along the way. Um, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to sit down and really listen to how graphene is a whole class of materials and that you don't have to really stop yourself saying, oh, supplier X is going to uh, transplant over to supplier Y. There's a lot of different nuances. It's much like you don't just buy fumed silica from Avonic and expect that to be the same from making it up a BASF, right? You know it's all going to be different and graphene is going to be much the same way. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you so much. That was great. Um, we appreciate the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. So like Kevin just said, we've got a few minutes now for questions um, for the presenter. So attendees, um, if you have a question, please use the Q&A field right now. Um, we've got a few in already, so we'll start with these. Um, so we have, let's see, a couple of questions here related to thermoplastics. I don't know if you can speak to that, but um, how how does the presence of ego in a thermo or how would the presence of ego in a thermoplastic tape affect bonding between layers, and do surface react reflectivity changes, if any, require different settings in heat sources for tape laying? <laughs> what a great question! Wow, um, how much time does everybody have? Uh, wow, forty <laughs> minutes. Cool. Um, so. Okay, so you're asking about ego and not graphing in general. Um, ego itself, because, so 
Ego we've seen, even at 0.1% by weight in the resin, you increase that G1C by 150%. That is typically because it bonds the fiber and the and the polymer together better. So when you're you're putting ego into these TP tapes, right, um, it'll hold the layers together better. It's much like laying up a thermoset composite. So it, it increases that inner layer uh, bonding. Now, when it comes to surface reflectivity changes, um, it depends if you're going, well, it doesn't depend. You're, if you're going into a already black system, um, you're totally fine there. With Ego, we typically see a 20% increase in thermal conductivity at a 0.1% by weight loading. That is um, very unusual for graphene because usually to get any sort of thermal conductivity increases with graphene, you need something 0 0.5, 1, 2% sometimes depending on what graphene you plug in there um so hypothetically that should also decrease your input temperature for the tp tape um if you're able to take on more and offload more a lot quicker um you should be able to use uh less heat so it's a little bit more nuanced but um happy to discuss at any time clement great okay um a couple Farther down, we have um, another thermoplastics question. It's a little more general. Um, do you have to do you have to functionalize differently for thermosets versus thermoplastics? Um, it also depends. We've we've seen that with the epoxide functionality, uh, depending on what grade of nylon you go into, you can get some increases with that as well epoxies we've worked in polyesters uh, with that epoxide functionality we've seen better with acrylates and methyl acrylates um, those are more difficult to keep the spacing of that platelet so when i talk about spacing if you think of graphene you're like oh it's a 2d material but you have all these layers and in order to keep those layers not stacked together and form rocks you have to keep what's called despacing so with that despacing, you typically need that mm, about a nanometer or less, plus minus 0.5 nanometers. Um, when we plug in an acrylic functionalized system, you have to keep it in a wet state. Um, not to say that it couldn't work in a, a, a totally, totally dry state, um, but you get some good, 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 good increases with these esters. Um, you can make it for amines and urethanes and all that stuff and all of which are, are cooking in the back lab right now it's that you can functionalize and make a specialized product for every person but ultimately what we're trying to do at mito is to make it a very off the shelf solution that way you know anybody from Folsom or st croix or huntsman or anything like that can plug it into their system and start tweaking with that dosage to start getting these hyper increased uh properties that they weren't expecting to get with normal graphene. Okay, excellent. Um, can you speak to the difference between graphene oxide and graphene nanopowders? Mm. Okay, so graphene oxide to date has only been offered in a water-based solution. Um, that is because of the despacing. So when it comes to graphene oxide, you're right in that it is more expensive, but it's also used for more expensive applications. So like uh, sensors, clothing, that type of thing, um, because it's much easier to work with and it's already in a water solution that you can disperse into water-based applications. There is a graphene oxide-based powder on the market um, but you have a lot bigger layer count, it's a bigger particle size, a lot of different things with it. Not to say that it's not good, it's just a different form of delivery. Whenever it comes to graphene nanopowders, um, it's just that, nanopowders. Um, P100 masks cannot handle that. They can only filter to, I think it's like 0.5 microns reliably. Um, and nanopowders are typically 200 nanometers. Um, and of course, within that graphene nanopowder family, you have a lot of different things going on. So you can have like very flat sheets, crumpled balls, specific surface areas. It 
all plays into each other. Um, as well as with that graphene oxide, you could have different oxygen values, acidity values. It kind of depends on what people use to oxidize. I mean, it's a there's a, also a lot of different nuances in there. Um, and again, graphene nanopowders could be based on one price because it's cheaply produced with a cheap mechanical exfoliation system but you're going to get cheap results. You're essentially going to be putting filler into your system and saying, I have graphene in here. When, if you go the more expensive route for graphene and start paying, I don't know, uh, 200 times as much because you're using a more pristine version um, that it comes from a different source that is handled a little bit more carefully, it's going to, going to do different things. So there's again, a lot of levers to pull there to dictate how it's going to operate in your system. Right. Okay. Next question. Um, is there any advantage to having, to using graphene composites with aluminum used in die casting? Um, if I remember my melting temperature, right. Of, I mean, a basic aluminum, I'm not talking like aerospace grade. Um, I think the melting temperature of aluminum is too high for graphene. By the time any graphene is going to have some residual oxygen on there, I mean, either 1%, sometimes up to 5% I've seen. Um, by the time you get to the melting temperature and incorporate it into aluminum, it's going to degrade and kind of break apart. Um, not to say some would not survive, some would, but at that point you're putting a let's be honest, kind of an expensive material into a system that is going to form a crystalline structure in the first place for a reason. So to date, I haven't seen a good use of graphene and aluminum composites. Um, not to say it couldn't be coming down the pipeline somewhere, but I, I just haven't seen it. Okay. Um, going back to thermoplastics, how does graphene affect impact resistance in a thermoplastic comp compound? Um, it also depends on what thermoplastic compound you go into. So if you go into more of an amorphous structure like polypropylene um, with a highly crystalline graphene material with a very specific uh, DG band, uh, minimal defects, you you have to load it in such a way that it doesn't, like it, it either fully makes it crystalline or you don't mess with the amorphous structure too much. Um, Typically, I've seen our product, Ego, has gone into polypropylene before, and we've increased uh, flex and tensile properties 20-25%, um, just that 0.1% by weight concentration. Now, when it comes to other graphenes, there are other uh, polypropylene graphene master batches on the market. Um, I haven't seen any data on those, just because they are master batches that are then let down into other polypropylenes. So... Um, They've kept that uh, pretty close to the chest about the very specific grade of graphene and all the details uh, about that. So it it uh, you can get increases, but it depends on like if you go into a nylon as well. Nylon, if you put in too much graphene, it's a nucleating agent. It's it, most of the time it's dosage dependent. That is also driven by the morphology of it all. Okay. Um, next question. What can you mm -hmm. say about graphene as an additive for injection molded products? Uh, it plugs in. Um, as long as you can compound into uh, the pellets, you're good to go. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't seen a problem it actually going into an injection molding. Uh, I've seen it go into pultrusion, extrusion, injection molding. Um, film blowing is questionable because also dictated by morphology and crystallinity. So if you have too much of a nucleating agent, um, when you blow out the film, it'll just break apart. Okay. Um, next question is about concrete. Can you give any examples of how graphene has improved properties of concrete at scale? Uh, well, <laughs> again, how much time do you guys have? Uh, so this has been one of the things that I haven't fully bought into yet. Um, in order to actually go into concrete, you need a massive amount of material. 
while people are able to make a good amount of graphene collectively, um, one person has not been able to make, I think last I checked, you need like hundreds of thousands of tons of graphene. You can't do that. Um, but if you're able to plug it in right with the right oxygen content and water content and all that stuff, people have claimed that you can use 35% less material because you're increasing the strength so much. And oh, by the way, you don't have to use rebar. One, the only successful case that I've actually seen this happen is a company called Mega Slab in the U.S. Um, they they incorporate some different materials into their concrete mix, but they can pour. I think the largest pour I saw them do was like 300 yards without any stress relief lines. That's insane, and they've done it with. Um, they have slabs out there that are lasting five years, no cracking, and they're in heavy machinery usage. So backhoes and dump trucks are running over them every day and they don't crack. That's the only successful use case I've actually seen. Okay. Interesting. Um, the next question is, what's the lowest percolation level you've achieved by weight and volume? With... Um, Volume question is, um, again, polymer driven, so it, it's kind of different, but and graphene because graphene has a very low tap density, especially ego. Um, so by weight, we've been able to achieve percolation values at 0.1 percent by weight of the polymer of, of the part A. So we've gone into esters and epoxies that have increased that thermal conductivity values according to ASTM standards by 20 percent. Okay. Um, so the next question is related to the uh, Folsom Skis um, customer that you talked about. Mm -hmm. He says, you showed that strength is the same or lower with graphene, but the ski manufacturer claims increases in strength enabling weight reduction. Can you explain the contradiction? Yes. So let me... Let me read that question directly. One second. Let me find my screen. Okay. Ah, so I see where the, you can get that. So it's not that the graphene provides the same or lower strength increases. It's that it depends on what graphene you put in there, what morphology, mm -hmm. you might be flatlining some composite and some strength values. What Folsom saw with our material, Ego, that epoxide POS functionalized graphene oxide, is that when loaded at 1%, the strength increased by 35%. And on top of that, they measured with an accelerometer, the damping properties improved by 100%. It's that multifunctionality that is actually being put into play because of the morphology we chose, the source, and the chemical compatibility. Because of all that, it holds together better and any ski person that has actually touched these skis, and if they, they do backcountry skiing all the time, they're used to even lightweight skis or even the standard build skis. When you're going down the mountain, they chatter a lot. With our skis, the chatter was gone. They, they said it was like being handed the keys to an F1 car when they're used to a Ferrari. They actually had to slow them down because they felt like they were going too fast. So... Because of these strength and damping increases, Folsom went back to the drawing board, uh, looked at their core, and they took out a stringer of bamboo, which is one of their heavier materials. And so they were able to use less wood, get the same amount of damping, less composite. Overall, they made a, a ski that was 18% lighter, um, just with that 10 grams per set of skis. So ultimately, it, it just made sense. Um, they're looking at some different builds right now, um, looking at lightweighting other structures and what woods they can take out. And ultimately, it's lowering their carbon footprint because if you're saving that stringer of wood, these are massive four-foot-tall blocks that are, I don't know, three feet thick or something like that because they cut a couple different sets of skis out of that. Now, if you're saving bamboo and the processing time and plastic and all that, really realistically your carbon footprint is also being lowered because just of that 10 grams of graphene addition okay great thanks for clarifying 
Mm -hmm. um, the next couple of questions are about um, use of graphene for aircraft components, um, mm -hmm. about the use of graphene in composite airframe construction or, or lightning strike protection on aircraft. Um, so are you able to, uh, could you speak to work that may be done in this area? Is there any testing or do you have any thoughts about these types of applications? Oh man, uh, graphene and air composite aircraft composite structures. Um, yes, it does make sense. So using a graphene and an aerospace application with a lower percolation threshold, it can do a lot of different hypothetical multifunctional properties. So like lightning strike mitigation, because you have your composite actually increasing electrical conductivity. If you choose the right, again, chemical compatibility and morphology, uh, you could have a tougher system that can have a higher cyclical fatigue load that'll last longer and you can use less material. So overall, you can start thinning out uh, whether it's cores or skins or full-on composites, um, even injection molded parts. Ultimately, you can start transitioning more so away from metals to the composites and then from the composites to ultra lightweight composites because you're you're just putting in I don't like this term, but a sprinkle of this material. Um, really, a little goes a long way. And ultimately, in order to really achieve these lightweighting goals, sure, you can go back to the formulation board, um, really design these structures, redesign the structures, and get it implemented in 20 years. But why wouldn't you just look at the materials you're doing now and then see what kind of different additives you can put in there to increase those mechanical properties because you know what you're looking at, you know? Yeah, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the next question I assume is from somebody who works at a company that supplies graphene. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, they ask, how, mm -hmm. how would we become a qualified manufacturer to be able to supply you with graphene for the testing you're doing? <laughs> Hello and welcome. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, email me. Um, we're always on the lookout for different graphenes and graphene oxides, um, different bio scaffolds, different type of things. Um, ultimately, what we need is we'll take a sample and we'll run it through our analytical process, um, see what chemistries we can graph to it, um, how it affects morphology. Um, what it does within polymer systems and just go from there. We kind of run it through our own internal um, qualification standpoint and we compare what data you provide to the ISO ANSI standards, which are actually being implemented in November. And I'm pretty sure everyone in the graphene community is pretty aware of what they're asking for and what they're going to be setting up. Mm -hmm. um, looking at you know xrd and raman data and particle size and defects and all this different stuff that ultimately as we lay out this very hard standardization you're able to just look at this data sheet and go oh i understand what it's going to do that's what we do and then we do some like extra sauce on top of that so just email me jared i appreciate it sounds good um mm -hmm. the next question is have studies been performed using your functionalized graphene in combination with any of the thermoset composite materials qualified by NIAR in their NCAMP database? For example, Hexel's 8552S resin with carbon fabric or tape. <laughs> um, no, not to date. Uh, we haven't had anybody interested in that. So, of course, being a materials company, if we spent all of our time qualifying our material in every polymer or even heck let's say 50 percent of the polymers and fiber combinations out there mm -hmm. we wouldn't get off the ground um that's not very application focused what we like to do at mito is whenever we we come up with a new product whenever we have these very base results in house is that we have the customer interest to then partner up and start testing in their their setup their facilities their material combinations um that way, we're more market driven and not R and D driven. Um, if I was to just like test everything in the NCAMP database, 
this this talk wouldn't be happening. So we've we've made it very diligent to partner up with the with the customers and people who are actually looking for that data. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of questions about um, basically what is the maximum thermal conductivity for thermoplastic composites with graphene. I honestly don't remember that off the top of my head. Um, I'll have to dig through my database. Um, you mentioned polypropylene. Um, mm -hmm. have, you have you done any work in polypropylene composites, which typically have issues with bonding to fillers and fibers without additives? Um, we have done work in polypropylene without fiber reinforcement, mainly because from our experience, most people don't want fiber reinforcement in their PP um, because of a cost perspective. Now, backtrack, Ego um, typically favors fiber reinforcement. So for instance, if I put it in 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, I mean, any sort of loading into a neat resin system and I just run it through DMA or Instron, 80% of the time I'll get a flat line. Like it just shows no increases and people look at me like, what did, what did you provide me? Whenever we incorporate fiber into that mix, you actually start getting uh, flex tensile compression strength increases 20, 80% still with that same 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.5% loading. Now to round it back to polypropylene, we have done work in that without that fiber. And what we've seen is that with a sobic material, uh, we've increased flex and tensile strength and modulus all 20 to 30%. Um, so like the flex strength and modulus went up 25% and the tensile strength and modulus went up 20%. Uh, still with that 0.1% by weight loading, um, it was first master batch and then let down to that 0.1%. And so um, it's a very good question. I would expect that to actually increase dramatically whenever you incorporate that glass fiber or carbon fiber into the system. Okay. Um, so the next question is about um, composites for use in medical instruments. Um, will addition of would addition of graphene affect toxicity in USP class six medical composites in laparoscopic instruments inserted into the human body? Um, the question goes on talking about increasing fracture toughness <laughs> for protruded. <laughs> Um, parts. So I don't. I don't know. Is this is this medical composites and graphene within medical composites used in the human body? Is that something mm. you guys can speak to at this point? There, uh, we don't do that. Um, there, there are graphene companies out there that are doing graphene and medical applications. It's mostly sensors. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know of any graphene company that's doing what you're asking. Um, if you don't want uh, graphene will change the color of whatever composite it goes into, whether it's a very slight shift to the gray or even at 0.05%. I wish I had a container. Um, I don't. It's very black, very, very black. It absorbs something like 98% of the light that goes into it um, at 0.05%. So um, it's an interesting question. I don't know very interesting question. Um, Yatin, feel free to email me. Um, I can think on that, but I haven't seen it actually in the application that you're talking about. Okay. Um, the next question is, are graphene particles compatible with surfactant? Um, tough to say. Um, no, not really. Um, specific surface area plays into it. Um, you got a lot of different things going on that uh, doesn't, doesn't really. Okay. Um, have you done any work with, uh, PAIC polymers, low melt PAIC? Um, no, not yet. Uh, being that PAIC and PEAK are resins that need compounding, it is a much higher barrier to entry. 
Um, we are working on getting our own compounder in house that is going to be sufficient to use more than 15 grams at a time of plastic. Um, we do have one trial out there right now that is using a PAIC. Um, I should be getting feedback on that hopefully soon. Okay. Um, the next question is about infusion, which I assume is mm -hmm. what um, they must be currently using. Um, they ask, must the user switch to, they say infusion is, is being used to control resin content in the cured part. Mm -hmm. Must the user switch to manual layup or spray on prepreg with autoclave curing to use these products? Ooh, okay. So that's a tough one too. Um, typically, you would be able to, okay. That's one thing that you can't do with graphene is that typically it filters out. So if you do infusion, um, of course, the if I remember right, the space in between fibers is maybe five to seven microns. So anything bigger than that is just going to get caught and it's going to make a gradient. Um, not to say that you can't use it in pre-pregs. Um, I've I've successfully put it our put our material into um, pre-pregs, hot melt pre-pregs, solvent based pre-pregs at the manufacturer's line. So we you can do contract pre-pregging, um, graphene power pre-preg. It's easy enough if you know the right people. Um, other than that, hand layup, wet bagging, that type of stuff uh, is usually more favorable for these types of additives. And you're going to run into that even with you know other silicas and carbon nanotubes and all that different type of stuff just because you can't control the orientation of the platelet or the tube or anything like that so it's going to get hung up relatively easily okay um what is the particle size for ego ego ah oh, you did miss that i probably didn't say it um particle size is between 13 and right now we're sitting at about 35 40 microns so that's a dry particle size, but when you go into a, a thermoset system, we usually see that break down to about the 15, 20 micron mark at a D90. Um, when you go into thermoplastics, we typically see one to two microns, just because you have a lot more energy going into the system and you're compounding using that double barrel extrusion method. Okay. Um, how does for your products, how does impact property, um, I guess, compare to other graphene mm -hmm. products? Um, so our product, um, I actually just got results back. Um, we increased the impact properties of a nylon six by 37% unnotched, and then notched impact increased by 18% at a 0.1% by weight of the polymer. Um, Sometimes you go into other resin systems, um, it either flatlines, you get a single digit increase, or it decreases. Um, again, it's dependent on the, the crystallinity of the, the polymer structure. Um, you can get different results as well if you use more of a amorphous type of graphene uh, that has a different morphological structure. Um, you can do a lot of different things for plug and play. Whenever it comes to ego itself, um, that is established. Not to say that what we have in the back room right now going, uh, we're testing different morphologies, different sources, different graphenes um, to see, to better characterize and shop out to customers who would be more interested in a more, uh, like a, a crystalline material behaving with the toughness of a, a, a morphous material. So it's one of those things that's, while we are an R&D company, we're very market-driven to better uh, showcase and partner up with customers for what they're looking for. Okay. Um, so we have a number of questions related to 3D printing. Um, okay. Are you able to speak to use of graphene or these products within 3D printing, either powders or filaments? Yule powders. Interesting. Um, and that harkens back to the aluminum question. Um, yeah. y you're, you're making a very expensive uh, AM powder if you just throw in graphene in there. Because um, 
again, you're assuming the whole bucket is going to have the same amount of graphene per cubic centimeter, really tough. And then you're going to bet that that graphene gets snuck in there as it's going through the plasma process. It's just, it's a lot. Um, whenever it comes to other 3D printing methods, um, yes, it does plug in. You can plug it in. Uh, you can do extrusion. Uh, that's probably the most favorable. Um, SLA is tricky uh, just because of the light permeation. Uh, you need it to actually actively pass through um, and accept that radiation. And if you choose the wrong crystallinity and surface area, so if you, you put something into your acrylic resin that, albeit if it is functionalized, you're you're doing a lot better, but if if you throw it in that has a very high specific surface area, all that graphene is just going to catch that light before it gets to your desired area, so it's going to come out really jelly-like. So you just have to be aware, and again, the standards are going to very much help with this, being aware of what you're putting into that system to get the desired processing properties as well as mechanical properties. There are some... So to answer your question, yes, there is some data. Depends on the polymer. I know I keep saying that, but you have to watch your morphology and your specific surface area in order to successfully incorporate it into the systems. Okay. What type of radiation shielding properties can you achieve with these products? Ew, I haven't heavily researched that one just yet. Um, I haven't seen anything. I haven't heard anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's actually a benefit. Um, UV, yes. Anything beyond that? I don't know. I think it gets in between the platelets if I remember right, but yeah, I'd have to double check on that. Okay. Um, what about use of these products as a coating for textiles? Um, that's also a tricky one. Um, usually for textiles, so you don't want a nanomaterial just sitting on the textile. So um, coating it, that's not a favorable method. I don't like that method just because you don't know if it's fully on there, if it's hung up on there. It can dislodge easy. I usually recommend trying to do like an electro spinning, um, making the, the textile filament with the graphene involved. Um, let's see, is, is SEM a reliable indicator for actual graphene morphology as graphene layers will tend to aggregate when in dry state and under vacuum? Well, so yes, for the most part. So it will get you 80% of the way there. Um, so let me actually bounce back to that slide if I can get there we go okay so yes while you are saying that morphology wise dried sure and aggregated um, you can sonicate it and you can still cast graphene onto your sticky tape to get a 100% true indication of how that is going to look you can also do backlight mi uh, microscope you can do TEM, a whole bunch of different things. But ultimately, this is still a pretty good indication of how this is going to pan out whenever you use it in an application. So a lot of the miscommunication that comes from, oh, graphene is great, to, hey, this isn't doing anything for me, is the fact that this is typically what people encounter. So when you're you're taking this powder, it's already in a dry state and aggregated. Mm -hmm but it's still going to have some residual like little hangoffs. So um, these little tiny white dots next to this particle, those are actual full on true graphene platelets. Um, then you look at the top right, and that is typically what you handle in the first place is this very chunky quote unquote graphene that does not meet the ISO standards for graphene uh, because you should not see that edge on for a graphene. Um, so 
it does give you still a really, really good indication for your morph morphology. And of course, you want to plug it into an XRD to get your D spacing and your DG band and get more of a crystallinity aspect. But the shape and structure of your graphene plays very much into your morphology and what it's going to do to your system, how it wets out, and what your specific surface area is going to be. Great. Um, let's see. A few more minutes here. Uh, how does graphene compare to carbon nanotubes? Okay. Um, carbon nanotubes, you typically have to load at a much higher rate. Mm -hmm. um, something like 2% to get any sort of strength increases. And that's even if you can successfully incorporate it. There's a reason why the nanotube industry went under such hardcore consolidation and hasn't really had much market adoption is because of standardization, lack of understanding, and everybody pitched single walled as the next latest greatest thing. But ultimately, it is extremely hard to handle and no respirator can actually catch it. So it's cool in theory and it can do some things, but ultimately it's not very applicable to any industry um, that actually wants to achieve something. It can be used as like a, a kind of like a paint stabilizer to get a really, really dark black. Um, you can use it in, it, it's mainly for colorants. You don't ever really use it for strength things, but mainly for colorants from what I've been able to see. Okay. Um. This person asks, do you think that um, they could add a bio-based filler along with graphene to enhance mechanical properties? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, you can. Another one of our specialties is that we've been able to take the same process for ego for other beta variations that we have going on. And you can swap out the graphene or graphene oxide for a bio-scaffold. So right now we have some of those beta products out there being tested. Um, paper, papers have shown that silanes and silicones can actually biodegrade um, as well as partnered up with those bio scaffolds. Um, <clears throat> you can do that. Um, again, kind of feeds back to designing with the graphene in mind is that looking at what, I guess, levers graphene A is pulling to get a certain property, sure, you can add a, a biopolymer or a bio scaffold into the mix to try to sh overcome some of the things of graph a, graphene A are not able to do. But at that point, why don't you look around for like graphene B, C, D and see if you can actually hit those marks without adding another ingredient on top of that. Okay. Interesting. Um, next question. So obviously hydrogen tanks and liners are a popular mm -hmm. thing that a lot of people are working on right now. Um, have you seen use of graphene materials in this type of applications? They're trying. Um, it depends on, so let's just talk about type four because that mm -hmm. is the most used and probably most sought after. Type five would be nice. I don't think it's realistic unless they solve a lot of barrier properties, but graphene, if you can load it right and orient the platelets right, you can actually have drastically increased vapor barrier properties for hydrogen. Um, it's something like if you load it right, get it oriented right, you can have vapor properties, vapor barrier properties increase by like 200%. Mm -hmm. um, again, very much driven by a very flat flake, very, very mono layer. And it has to be oriented to where it essentially like stacks and it creates a much harder pathway. Um, you can do that whether it was in, in the propylene lining or even in the resin. But there's got to be a, a push and give somewhere that you can load it and get, you know, a 50% increase. Or even you can lightweight or you can increase burst strength um, because you're making it a tougher system. You're making, you're increasing that modulus, you're increasing that G1C. Um, we're working on that right now. I There are some companies out there that are using graphene um, in their tanks. It's more NASA-driven than anything else. 
Okay. Interesting to see how that, all that is, we'll go forward here. Um, so we're right up um, at the top of the hour here. So uh, come to the end of the webinar. Uh, we got through a lot of questions. Thank you to our audience for submitting so many great questions. Um, but we do have several that we were not able to answer live. Um, so these will all be saved and forwarded to Kevin and the MITO team to be addressed later. Um, Kevin, thank you so much again for this presentation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. And thank you also to our attendees for joining us today. We appreciate you being here and we hope you will join us again for the next Composites World webinar. For more information, please visit compositesworld.com and have a good day, everyone.